Greetings, friends. Today, on the day of commemoration reconciliation, we continue the marathon which has been going on on three television channels since the very morning. Premier uh, Channel 5 and Espresso. Together, we discuss and become aware of contemporary European civilization approach to World War II and remind you about the new threat against peace in Europe, which is Russian aggression against Ukraine. I would like to introduce my co host, Jana Bugarkova, who is a literature scholar and uh, from, from Ukrainian Pen Club. Uh, thank you, Larissa. I would also like to introduce my co-host, Larissa Gubida, who is a TV journalist of Channel 5. I'll remind you that our TV marathon, uh, Peace and War, has been organized with Ukrainian Pen Center uh, jointly with Kiev Mohila Academy. On this panel discussion, we're going to discuss the culture and war, Ukrainian memory, uh, which has the fresh pain of contemporary world Russia put on against it. Uh, the cultural field allows us to become aware of this harsh reality and finally win. So, I would like to invite our guests, Ukrainian film director Artem Seytablayev and Ukrainian writer Tamara Gorikhazernia. So, friends, just as always, we are going to have guests on Skype. Director Sergei Loznitsa, director and writer Irina Tsilik, and writer Victoria Manina, and also playwright and director Marius Vashkevichus from Lithuania. Also, together with us, in video format, we are going to have Ukrainian writer Sergei Zhidan, who has recorded a video, which we are also going to show and discuss with our guests in the studio. So, we start our and dear friends. So let us first do it so that each speaker on this broadcast voices their opinion about this part of the marathon. We decided to talk about culture for almost two hours. Culture and war. Why so? Because not that many Ukrainian TV channels and few, uh, uh, they have few programs of these days about the importance of culture in the context of war. In the beginning of year we had this narrative which is uh, said, which says so was the difference and at the time when there is war going on in the country I believe that's very dangerous and that's what I would like us to base our discussion upon and understand that what the difference is not the right way to go Ukrainians need to be aware in which situation the country is now in the context of World War two and the war that we have now Achtem. just a minute for each person to voice the opinion and then we'll do the discussion well, possibly, if there were no difference for my parents where to live, and in general, whether there was a question to come back to Ukraine or not, I'm sure that we would have never come back. In our family, not a single moment, not a single time have I heard that we have such assumption that we might not come back to the Crimea. That is why in my family there is a difference. Where you live, what is the name of the street you live in, who you remember, and why you live. Uh, thank you, Artem. What about you, Tamara? You are a Ukrainian writer and you have dedicated your novel to the war, War in Donbass. You became a well-known writer after that. So, your introductory word, please. Uh, we live in the times which shows and lots of things. And when there is war in your country, you cannot be neutral. You are either on that side or on the other side. And your stand is not defined by the outlook of what you are saying. Your position is only noted by what you do. And inaction in this situation means collaboration with the enemy, and this means working against your state and against your country. This is a very responsible time, or an honorable time, and, and very, very trembling time, so to say. And I understand that we shouldn't be standing on the side. We have to go toward the way you want. If you can just pass the shells, or you can transfer money, 
you can bring food, you can write, you can shoot, but you have to do something for your country. Otherwise, when they're going to ask you, your grandsons, like, Grandma, what did you do when there was war? And you are going to take other person's uh, achievements. Yes, and difference in our time, that's most probably the biggest enemy for Ukraine. Yes, and today we're going to discuss this topic as well, because the people who are now writing, making films about war, they face the same prejudices and problems, and I hope that we're going to discuss that. Okay, then. Well, as I said, we have speakers uh, with us over the video, Sergei Lesnitsa, I see you, and thanks for joining our marathon. What do you think about the culture in the context of war and in general? Uh, what kind of uh, words should you use for Ukraine so that they could hear the things that we tell you about today? Uh, good afternoon. Well, war destroys culture in general. And it is strange to connect one thing with the other because one destroys the other. Could you please explain your opinion? War destroys culture. Uh, can't you say that there are things being created in Ukraine which are imprinted? There are cultural masterpieces through which the world finds out about Ukraine. Well, war is the readiness of people from the one and the other side to kill each other. That's a tragedy for both countries at the same time. Well, that was laconic, and I think we're going to discuss that, whether war destroys culture, because that's a rather disputable statement at in the very minutes of our broadcast. Okay, let's move on. Let us ask Irina Tsilik, who is film director and writer. Irina, your introductory word about the connection between culture and war. Uh, what is that connection, and whether it is positive for culture, maybe destructive? as Sergei has just said. Uh, good afternoon. Actually, I didn't think that I would need to talk about war in general, because, you know, when we were small, my generation thought that war is something from the past or something our grandmas tell about. And my grandma told me about her growing up in occupied Kiev, and now my son is a child who grows in the times of war. and. Uh, Ukrainian-Russian war has been going on for the seventh year. We react to it in this or that way. We are traumatized by it in this or that way. And I totally agree with Tamara that each in their own place has to do what they can. And if we use words or other abilities to document our present and our attitude towards the war, then we have to do that, even though actually this is a very disputable topic and saying, uh, talking about war in general, how to talk about it. I think that writers, filmmakers and all the other intellectuals who live here and now are looking for their way and their language to see what kind of instruments we can use. So it's great that there is field for this discussion and I'm happy to be their part. Well, we start our discussion. And I'm asking you, what's your opinion about this discussion? Because as Riel Lusetia has just said, and I'm still digesting this statement, I understand that if our artists are not going to explain using cultural instruments, that uh, then diff other people are going to do the instead of us. Yes. I think that for most of us, actually, they still don't have prepared answers to that. But it's very important to put all these uh, questions here and now, what's happening. Uh, so, actually talking about war and peace, that's thin ice. We understand that living in the times like now, it's very hard. All those books which are written, all those films that are made, we are looking for ways to talk about it in, a, in an appropriate way. Because talking about the things happening to us, we form memory about that. And on the other hand, it's necessary to document that so that later we could turn back and 
analyze who we were and what happened to us. Maybe I I'm explaining that in a rather confused way. I'm still looking for answer to the question. Yes, we'll be looking for answers for two hours. Yes, we'll still have many questions. Thank you, Rina. Uh, Victoria, culture and war. What could this connection be? How do you see it? And what would be the arguments that you would put forward to say that culture is important? Well, you know, war does destroy culture. War destroys everything. But it seems to me that we have to think about what culture does at the same time while there is war going on. Yes, uh, war does destroy culture and everything, but that's why culture has to counter this total destruction. Culture has to create new connections and not to allow us to go into the state and Second World War actually shows that what this uh, brings us to and what kind of stage can the society reach when human rights are violated, when state institutions are violated. And that is why we need culture at this time. And that is why we see uh, how it becomes more active in Ukraine, because we counter this war. And I also wanted to say the following that we were attacked not because Russia needs our resources, not because it needs some material things. Actually, this war is around the right to call a spade a spade. It is for the right to call the uh, the things uh, a spade a spade a spade in your country. And for a long time we were forced to allow to call things uh, in another way. It was a so-called semantic war. We allowed the narrative of the Soviet Union and Russia to somehow dominate in our space and in our discourse about World War II. It is why now it is extremely important to bring ba back the right. And uh, this is done through culture, namely. So here I can't even imagine what kind of field can be equal by importance uh, to actually uh, culture. That's army and education. So we actually have a video record made by Sergei Zidane who asked him about the connection between war and culture, and he answered this question. So we ask our directors to show this video, and then we'll come back to the studio for discussion. Friends, hello everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to be involved in this discussion and conversation because actually that's very interesting and relevant to try talking about our right to memory and why not all of us are ready to use that right. It seems to me that the problem is that when talking about this right to memory we mean the right to our own memory. While they try to offer their own option, their own own vision, their own concept of our historical past, our political past, which is not totally acceptable for us. In the context of the end of World War II and these days, the days when we remember those who have perished, those who died in this war, the question about right to our memory is more than relevant. Because many of our compatriots are still in this discourse of post-Soviet or uh, Russian perception of this view on history, when it's not just about respect for those who died, not for respecting their memory, not for honoring them, but just even the slogan, we can repeat it, I mean, it's not about respect to memory, it is about demonstrating your power threats and attempts to, uh, uh, to be an aggressive dominant in the conversation in the context of Russian and Ukrainian war, which has been taking place for the seventh year in a row. The slogan we can repeat, which is historically directed against the Nazi regime, to a great extent from Russia is directed at us, at contemporary Ukrainians, who have dared to resist, who have dared to stand up to their viewpoint, and 
remind themselves in the world that we have the right to memory, we have the right to the past, we have the right to the history, but it has to be our memory, our past, our history. Well, uh, obviously, this is not the part of ideological concepts of uh, political uh, technologies in Russia, and the day that should have united us, because we are talking about the past, we are talking about memory, and those who are not with us today, actually, it is still a quite irritating and very convenient political and ideological manipulation, unfortunately. And it seems to me that that's a rather uh, spot on uh, description of Ukrainian society, which is uh, divided, uh, doesn't have any landmarks and cannot decide on its path. So that's why it's very hard for it to move forward. But I think we'll overcome it and is going to be fine. And also, if you allow me, I will add a couple of words about and to compare how we talk using artistic means about World War II and Russian-Ukrainian War. Why is our narrative about current events in the east of the country in Donbass more convincing and more impressive and expressive, more directed at the future? But instead, our attempts to talk about history sometimes rather traumatic and uh, rather problematic. So what's the question? The question, I think, is about your view on the events happening, uh, speaking about war with Russia and about war with the occupants. We talk uh, from our own position. We don't listen to anyone else's hints. We don't use any concepts which are given to us from outside. This is our view, our country. We protect it and we protect our future. So in this case, of course, similar things uh, sound rather convincing uh, and impressive way. But when we talk about history, we're still doubting, hesitating between different concepts. We cannot find our own angle that would show our understanding of history and our perception of the past and our attempts to deal with our own memories. So that's a rather complicated and traumatic process, no doubt. But I think we have to pass it in this other way. And we can talk about our history from our standpoint, from the standpoint of Ukrainians. And if we don't do that, others will do that instead of us. And we, um, they are not going to take into account our interests. So, we've heard a range of very interesting opinions, and let's proceed to the discussion. I was even making notes, you know, how come we are still you are using this uh, Soviet Union statements about the Second World War? Why are not we not calling the things by their names? Oh, and war is destroying culture. Mr. Achtem, I would like to resort to you. To what extent Ukraine have abandoned their Soviet heritage and do they really understand that the Second World War is not the Great Patriotic War and whether the war is really destroying the culture? Of course the war is destroying the culture. That's obvious. And the other thing would be that I agree with what was mentioned by Irina Tsilik that What's in our hands? What we can do? We, we really have the tools to find a way to each other's hearts, and we shall talk to others and talk in the first place to ourselves. We have to understand what our history means to us, and we have to reflect on various uh, historical events and current events, in what way we feel, what we dream about, and I believe this is quite an obvious thing, that culture is it's really a toolkit, a very good toolkit to find a way to each other, to find some common grounds with each other, even if we're discussing very painful topics. And it's also worth underlying that this toolkit may be used differently, and people use it differently. And if we go back to Soviet, post-Soviet narrative about war, let me tell you that I was born in the Soviet Union and until a certain period in my life everything related to war was 
usually thanks to Soviet movies and sometimes those were high quality examples as I look at them from today's standpoint. At least it feels like that maybe the film of Mr. Bykov or Herman. I felt myself to be part of the Soviet Union, which um, gained the victory in the war, which liberated the world. And when I was going to the seventh or eighth grade back at school, I've heard the motto. Um, well, actually, this is, a, this is a modern motto. We can repeat that. And if I've heard that motto, we can repeat it um, back as a teenager, maybe I would even support it. But now you're creating another atmosphere by your your movies, which pertain to war, deportation of Crimean Tatars, you show the Ukrainians and the world the real picture, the reality. Do you actually feel, yeah, yeah, I'm approaching that. Uh, but uh, when I was uh, still a fifth grade, uh, and by the way, I lived and was born in Uzbekistan because my parents were deported there. And, you know, there was the discourse that all the Crimean Tatars betrayed the Soviet motherland, but according to Soviet statistics, more than 90% of men of Crimean Tatars, uh, 16 plus, uh, were members of the Red Army. So at the very same time, when, for example, the character of uh, Haidarma movie, Midhan Sultan, was participating, actively participating in lab liberation of his big motherland and the smaller one. His family was deported because they were accused of total collaboration with Nazis. And now I'm coming back to uh, my uh, history. When you hear from the uh, history teacher, at uh, this very town where there were so many Crimean Tatars. Out of 44 uh, students in the class, there were 22 Crimean Tatars, uh, Germans from uh, Volha region, uh, uh, in Gushes and uh, Chechens. And when you hear from the history teacher who went through the war and uh, was actually lecturing to us history, he had uh, all uh, all those medals on his chest. He was mentioning that liberation of the Crimea didn't take that much blood, and not a single drop of blood would be shed if it were not for the betrayal of Crimean Tatars. Can you imagine that? Well, and my parents went back to the they didn't find their families there, you know, because they were deported. That was a great disappointment. And I, as a kid, I was playing with my uh, grandfather's medals. I knew my grandfather was a hero of war, but it took him three years to find his family after the war. It was really painful, you know. It was unacceptable to tell you more. And we started discussing and we started yelling everywhere that our parents are not traitors, they haven't betrayed their motherland. And uh, I don't know uh, how come our parents were that brave uh, back in Soviet Union in 1981. All the parents of all the students from my class came to school and they protested against that teacher. Yeah. And it was a revelation for me. So, back then, I understood that I was living in two worlds. At home, I live in the world where they understand that the Soviet regime was destroying my people. But there was another life at the school where I've heard some things I liked sometimes, but I couldn't understand what was happening to me. 
with this two parallel realities. I didn't have the cold mind to analyze it all, and sometimes it's difficult to analyze it all even today. But when you understand that it becomes vital to find your own narrative. Well, you know, Ukrainians currently live in these two parallel worlds as, worlds as well, because Ukrainians live in two parallel realities, and they are choosing the one which fits them. That's very good that currently we are retailoring and rethinking the concept. And I would like to resort to Mr. Loznitsa. We know you as... Uh, um, the person who created Maidan movie, etc., and other movies. And I know that you've created the movie which was shot in Germany, which was uh, presented in Germany, which is called Victory Day. And that movie is very interesting because it describes the 9th of May and in what way the V Day is celebrated in Berlin, in uh, the country which did not win the war. So tell me, please, how come this idea became important? to you and what was the result overall result of this film the thing is that for quite a lengthy period of time in Trepto Park they celebrate this day and people who live in Berlin or in Germany in general come there those who used to be uh, citizens of Soviet Union, um, maybe uh, Ukrainians, people from Kazakhstan, they go there, and uh, representatives of power go there as well, and bikers go there, and uh, various paramilitary organizations join the event. Also, the left-wing politicians from Germany go there. They have their own narrative, by the way. And it all resembles a very strange carnival. There are so many uh, different narratives, and it's interesting to watch that all, and I decided to shoot a movie about that. That is really strange for me. Why? Because people live in one world, and all of a sudden, some day divides them that much. And you know, I see that they live in different worlds now, in the world of heroism, of Soviet songs, uh, the world of pride for the victory. There are other people who come just to cry. There are this category. There is this category of people as well. And that's what I liked about that place. Thank you, Sergei. And when we have a look at what's happening in Moscow, in Russia, we again see this myth and this victorious hysteria. And we don't see the tragedy in it all, right? We hear about the victory only. And if you compare what you see and display in your movie and this militarization of um, this very day, the 9th of May, are there any differences or you see the same in these two events? Well, there are some differences because the 9th of May in Trapton Park ended up in brotherhood of all the nations where Russians, Germans, and uh, this old gentleman, elderly gentleman in uh, Ukrainian embroidered uh, uh, shirts, they were happy together and they cried together. And there were such mottos as Russia, Germany, Ukraine together, which was quite strange. And if we are talking about Russian propaganda and an opportunity to join people around some symbol, I can tell you they've succeeded in that. And that's an interesting experience, which turned into some mock-up, and it would be interesting to shoot a movie about that as well. 
because we see lack of knowledge about what really happened at that war, lack of understanding of the strategy which took place and uh, into which all the nations of Soviet Union and not just Soviet Union were involved. And for me, that's a very strange phenomenon. Right here, when we're talking about Russian propaganda and those symbols, I believe they figure more and more of those symbols every year, and this immortal regiment, and uh, uh, our grandfathers were fighting for freedom. Tamara, do we currently uh, have to walk this path and also use the symbols, or maybe shall we displace this symbol? Symbols, but by something of our own, patriotic songs, movies, spirit. We cannot condemn people who are crying these days, but we have to offer something, except for this Soviet narrative. Well, we all know that Russian propaganda has got no, bird, no borders, just horizons. That's actually their motto. And the use of the great patriotic war uh, myth is one of the tools of propaganda, which has nothing to do with war, with humanity, or with perception of mm, the history. You know, I was in Turkey one year ago, and I saw, uh, I saw waiters wearing the St. George uh, um, stri 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 strip, and I was shocked. I, uh, I told my husband, wow, let's run away from here. Uh, I cannot bear this view. You know, they turned the war into something um, really unpleasant, and they are really mocking the war and lying about even Ukraine's role in this war. And that is another tool they use uh, in their war against Russia. And I remember that there was the bus filled in by Russians, and we uh, come inside and we say Доброго дня, and there was the silence, and uh, that was, you know, the most polite uh, tour trip. No one was saying anything because they understood who were Ukrainians, and we all of a sudden used Ukrainian language to uh, to say hello to them, and it it caused tension. It caused tension because they clearly understand who is fighting against whom in Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, who occupied the Crimea. And I would be very happy and calm for Ukraine when in the public space, like in today's marathon, in today's program, we, people are going to say no to those who are willing to speak Russian, but would be asking to speak English, to make Ukrainian English the language of the marathon. And we shall see is calling ourselves people of post-Soviet era. And that's great that we are not talking about ourselves as about uh, citizens of the Commonwealth of um, Independent States. That's great that that went to the past. And we are not saying any longer that we are CIS citizens. No, we are Ukraine citizens and we have to clearly see our place, including in the history, and at that very stage, I would be calm for the future of uh, my children. I'm not against Russian language, but I'm for the bright future of Ukraine, and I will always stand Ukrainian ground, and we have to take our own side, and we have to rethink everything what happened before, and we have to try to reach everything which is reachable, because whenever we make a pause, it is filled with the Russian myth. Thank you so much. Very interesting and important arguments. I would like to resort to Mr. Marius. You sent uh, this um, text uh, to us. That's fantastic. That's very interesting. And it uh, tells the non-standard uh, history of uh, the Second World War. As far as I understand, it's the history of your family. 
part of the family uh, is from Belarus, then Kazakhstan, then they were mobilized to uh, what to Polish army, and they were conquering uh, Rome. Please tell us that story again, because it allows us to have another look at the world war. You're welcome. Okay, so I understood that the Russian language is not acceptable by some participants. So let's switch. To uh, yes, it's 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 story kind of alternative story of the war, unknown story. We say but we have like big big sides: the Russian side, German side, American side. This is there were people, you know, uh, which were deported uh, from uh, Belarus at that time. Polish-speaking people. It was my my re my relatives, my brother, my, my grandfather. And uh, in Kazakhstan, when they were in Kazakhstan, and got ability to join Anders army, uh, army was made from deported Polish people uh, and, uh, and for them it was for them it was possible to escape of this deportation and so they, they I mean, it's very local way and before they were to through uh, Iraq uh, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, there were uh, teached all of which were the biggest, the biggest battle was for Rome, on the casino. <laughs> Union forces couldn't take, you know, Nazis, Nazis, Nazis. Forces and when yeah, it was the last battle, it was and and but that's not the, 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 the maybe the, the tragedy of the story from other side of the story, but after the war, uh, they kind of became just people, placed person, not veterans, and then just placed person in somewhere in deep Great Britain without. Uh, no, could, could be normal, could be could, like everybody because the local British look at them at the enemies. Why they? Why are they why is there? And what are they doing? So, uh, enemies may make big collaborations. So, that story, and I story, and I think I'm invisible. Unheard by us. Yeah. We are now remembering stories which are close for the people in the studio, the artists and us, and we understand that uh, the history of World War II are intertwined with the stories of the war which is now happening in Ukraine. Irina Tsilik told us the story that the film, The Earth is Blue Like an Orange, uh, Sundance Festival and actually the winning. I have been thinking for a long time about it. And when we are going to studio today, Today, there was this, there's this festival on which takes prizes and wins, but along with that, there should be something simpler for perception, right? Should the artists place their bar high and hold it on? What do you think? Irina? Do we have Irina with us? Yes, looks like Irina is not there with us. So let us then ask a similar question to Victoria. You, in your, in your artistic work, Home for Home, which was actually noted as the best Ukrainian prose at the festival Zaporizhia Buktoloka, in this text there is also this experience of Second World World War in Lviv, why did you choose this topic and is it associated with maybe some family legend or some family story of yours? Thank you for the question. Actually, this story 
is associated with the fact that during this Russia and Ukrainian war, I started seeing lots of people who lost their homes, who had to leave Donetsk, Luhansk, Bochisarai. Among those, in particular, my relatives. So for me, this topic of being uh, chased away from your own house and persecution, that became very relevant for me. And actually, I decided to write this story in my book, Home for Home. There is Holocaust uh, happening in Lviv as well as uh, the famine, because Ukrainians from the East uh, live in an apartment where Stanislav Lem used to live, and this is a person who lived through Holocaust in Lviv, because this is a Polish right of Jewish descent, and in this way, these two stories are intertwined, and in the end it just turns out that these two memories are very connected, and that's really so. So this first mentions and first descriptions made by Vasil Groisman, that writer with, uh, from Berdevichuk, he uh, named his novella, which tells a lot about Holocaust, everything flows, started from the famine. And it seemed to me that it was important to show this connection. And in the West now they talk a lot about it. And actually these tragedies are connected. And... Uh, uh, actually, he knew about the Soviet experience of the famine, and in this way of murder was also used for military hostages from the Red Army, for example. And he was going to use all these methodologies of the Soviet Union, and on the contrary, when the world understood uh, what Holocaust was and was able to analyze this tragedy, then we Ukrainians were able to use this language that the world uses to talk about Holocaust to manage to reflect better what was happening in Ukraine in 1932 and 33. So that is why this connection did form in my well, novel Home for Home. Well, now I see we have Irina Silik with us. I don't know if you heard my question, but I was talking about your film about Krasnogorivka, a documentary, uh, The Earth is Blue Like an Oish at Sundance Festival. That's festival cinema, and that's great. In the world, they start learning about Ukraine and see now pain. Maybe in parallel, uh, there should be also less elite more understandable art. Am I just saying some uh, unimaginable things? So is there something to be discussed? I agree to talk about, especially that I think that I'm on your side. Because I am of those filmmakers who want to make films for a wider audience. And if we talk about this film specifically, Earth is Blue is like as an orange, this, there is this fresh experience showing that this film actually is has transformed into this audience um, my mainstream uh, film because we had Ukrainian pre prime premiere at Docu Days Festival and we had a rather unique experience as I believe because for one day for 24 hours while the film was broadcast online there was a feeling that thousands of people watched it we received a lot of feedback and there is this clear understanding that we went beyond our bubble, beyond those people who normally go to the festivals or documentary film. So I think that it is very important really to have this opportunity to talk to a wider audience on this topic. Yes. Well, we have four more minutes and we're going to make a sh short break. One more question then to Irina. I cannot but ask that question. And Irina, except your film, I saw it and I believe that it's an extremely interesting film. I read your uh, collection of short stories and one of them is called uh, Red Traces on Black that really touched me because you tell a story of today's Kiev, you walking around with your small son, but also there is a story, as I understand, that's an autobiographical story. There's the story of your grandma who lived in Kiev during World War II, and it is rather tragic. So could you please tell something about it in the context of what we've been discussing, this war? 
How one war is juxtaposed against another one, as our current war is also now opposed to the World War II. Yes, there is this feeling of some kind of closed circles that we are in, and I have never thought that this feeling of closed circle is going to touch my family as well. I started talking uh, during this broadcast that my, when my grandma told me about her experience, how she was that young girl who with her mom on the first night when they were bombing Kiev, they visited someone and that's how they were alive. Because it is on this night that uh, uh, their small apartment uh, in Sakaidachna in Podil was actually bombed. Uh, she was three and a half or four, and my son was also three and a half when Maidan in Kiev started. And the first week of Maidan, he was going with us. He even had this weird experience for a child because he spoke from Maidan stage. This small boy who had the mic, and he said, Glory to Ukraine, and he heard many thousand people answer him. And later, these strange parallels. What was happening to our grandmas and grandpas here and now, we're living through that and we see our children living and perceiving war as something normal, as a background of their life. And yes, this is how this short story was born, black, uh, Red Traces on Black, and everything that I have been doing during the last 60 years, everything is around these topics. Okay then, we have collected a huge amount of opinions and statements. We have one minute each to sum up this hour of our broadcast. After a small pause, we're going to continue. It polarizes, it uh, puts the nerves and it pushes towards some new forms, you as artists. What do you think during all these years, have you managed to find those forms which would unite Ukrainian society? Uh, said, well, I believe that there is huge search going on and there is powerful work of my colleagues in feature filmmaking and documentary filmmaking and our writers. I believe that we will never do enough so that we could tell each other, okay, this topic is now closed, let's not reflect any more about war, because unfortunately the whole history of humanity tells us that people fight, people go to war, and if you feel the need for it, if you have what to say, you have things to say, first of all, from the humane point of view, then you have to do that. Okay, Tamara, war has created such a rich background for a writer and an artist, a filmmaker. So you just go and uh, you can take a whole baggage of your experience. This is a conflict of characters. This is circumstances revealing person from unexpected angle. And this is also something that we could only imagine in theory. Now we see that in practice, in real life, and we have to uh, grab it and preserve it for other people, for our children as well, because hopefully they will not see that in the future. Hopefully they will only read about it from our books, from what we write about it. Well, uh, so our marathon has come to its middle. We have talked to our speakers now. We have a break because each TV channel which is involved today into the TV marathon, this channel 5, Espresso and Premi, have a small part of their own broadcast and now we are going to go to our work and after the news we'll come back to the studio and to our communication. Friends, we are coming back to our studio. I'll remind you, we still have Peace and War TV Marathon organized by Ukrainian Pan Center jointly with Kiev Mohil Academy. Today, in this panel discussion, we talk about culture and war. But before continuing our discussion with our guests, we'd like to show you a video where you're going to see the fragments from the films by Irina Tsilik, Sergei Luznitsi, Aktem Seitablayev, and also photos of a well-known Ukrainian photographer, Alexander Gadyalov. Except that there are also records from statements of 
Ukrainian writers and actors with soldiers at the front. It is wish that and then come back to the studio for discussion. It happens that you are going somewhere with the convoy. You have to actually take some water because they haven't drunk anything. Without water, food and normal sleep. But in the beginning of war, they didn't even have necessary equipment. In such conditions, they had to defend Ukrainian land from the Russian aggression. About courage and vigor of the soldiers, they wrote and filmed. The first documentaries appeared after several months of resistance in 2014. Now, there are already tens of those guys. Ukrainians and the feature films about war only appeared several years after the start of the aggression. Then they started saying that Ukraine can make high-quality Ukrainian cinema. Directors were making films about painful issues. For example, Ilovais 2014, Donbass Battalion. This film tells about military action next to Ilovais. Then hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers come back home and just as many were injured or taken hostage. Finding the effort to laugh at war, the Ukrainians only managed to do the only seventh year of the fight. Yes, they won't lose for us. What about lockers and kids? What about animals? The only film in a comedy genre is Our Kitties. Uh, it was only uh, released this year. The events are at the beginning of the war. That's the adventures of three soldiers and the adventures during they have been on duty. The film was made based on real stories of Ukrainian army people. Ukrainian war is discredited and also reconciliation disrupted before the contact group, seeing themselves on a big screen. Ukrainian film about war is brought to the front and demonstrated to the war. They are uh, not only supported by the film, also the theater film. We actually, I would like to vote to you like this. And kiss this land so that it is Ukrainian. I, so that there is light, there is art, music, and everything that is there. Here it's different. Yes. I'm actually here working. What are you seeing? Do you think I'm a person? Don't worry. Actually, I respect the British. In seven years, the playwrights created tens of performances for Britain. Sometimes they also invite veterans. As for music, that's also something that joins war. The lyrics are often written by the soldiers themselves. Там далечі за яром гаю свої пісні співає Соловей. Книги є про війну написали вже сотні і продовжують писати. They keep writing those books. Often the veterans themselves, after recognition, they already called writers and poets. They announced which were then taken by publishing houses. They are written during the being on duty under the hits of weapons. Just like any book that was an anti-war book. Because this is that's bad, but feats of small people, my friends, I'm thankful to them that I actually wrote that. Uh, Madagascar is a nuclear country. And uh, their authorities use that. Every day in the East is another story for new books and films. Now, such days are about two and a half thousand. The war goes on. Well, I'm on my own land. Come back home. Come back home. So, unfortunately, we have war going on. Unfortunately, we still have Ukrainian things to watch. That's what I'm going to tell you. I will remind you, we have Aktem Sitabla and Tamara Grykhozina with us. On our Skype, we have Sergei Lizetir and Sergei Kutoria Maria and Marius Ivashkevichus. And after this material that we have watched and my colleagues from Channel 5 prepared, I have one question. What other cultural product we would need?
so that we could start our dialogue in the society, so that we could start, found our joint opinion. So, Ahtem, that's a question for you. Well, quite possibly, I'm not going to say anything new to you. It has to be diverse, because we see that the life also works in these ways, that is ambivalent. And during the war, there is this huge explosion of creative energy, which talks about it in any genre and tries to create the same instruments, thanks to which we can talk to ourselves. Because rather often, you cannot help yourself, you cannot answer lots of painful questions, and that is why even if you don't find this clear answer, that you have to do in, in this way specifically, well, at least you will find the way towards at least the sublimation on the territory of art. Won't be, of course, if you want this, it won't be destructive, because I'm convinced that any work of art in any genre, first of all, it has to build or create. And they only managed to laugh during the seventh year of war, that's what I noted. Well, first of all, I mean, I respect the authors of this film, first of all, because they were brave enough, because you have to dare to move in between the streams, so to say, and make a film, after watching it, you won't have the feeling that this was some kind of offense uh, to these events. But on the other hand, you will also be, will be frankly and honestly smiling, because this was done with internal pain, but sublimated through laughter, and that is why that's rather cool, I have to say. Okay, uh, I'll continue. I have an interesting question here. You are an author of Cyborg Skill. That's a heroic movie which uh, was very strong and popular in Ukraine. Everybody watched it and, and it develops this heroic theme of this war. But at the same time on this war, except victories and heroic things, there are lots of failures. And the first failure is that it's still continuing and it never goes anywhere. In your opinion, how do you show the weakness of Ukraine so that it becomes our strength, the weak spots? Well, I allow myself not to agree with you about the definition of the genre for Cyborg's film. If you have the feeling, or after you watched it, that it is also one brick into building the myth, uh, which is based on real people, real stories, then, yes. But first of all, I wanted to tell the, about what you said in the second part of your question, about something that's not simple. And that's why uh, most part of the film is dedicated to the way people, when they are in the same uh, situation in the war, they protect land, uh, their children, their families, and they speak out very complicated issues. There are no news, there are no new issues that were raised here. We could have seen all of that and we still see it in conversations with each other, but still that's heroic, that's a heroic image, these people are heroes, yes, that's what I'm saying. Who is not a hero in that movie? And you know now the uh, nurses and uh, doctors are heroes as well. They are actual heroes. And if a person understanding that their next step can result in death from the viewpoint of person's psychology, it's not a norm from the viewpoint of them doing it consciously, protecting those around, well, yes, that's a hero then. And I would like to tell you that we've started using these means in art and 
uh, we were using this means to uh, disclose some difficult topics, to reveal some difficult topics. And in this way, we are dealing with the pain in the society. And that's one of the major tasks, actually, of the art to do so. We are talking for the second hour in a row, and I've noticed we haven't mentioned the word state, uh, uh, state powers. Yeah, we are like um, uh, posing this burden on the shoulders of artists. But I would like to ask all of you, what about the state nowadays? In what way the state is communicating with you? And what are they saying? What is needed at the state level? Mr. Serhi, this is the question to you. So what do you think? In what way the state is currently communicating with artists? And is there the state support, state order, or the emphasis has shifted to uh, uh, Svati serials shot by uh, 95th? Well, at the very beginning, I would like to go back to the issue of language. I'm going to use the language which is my mother tongue, which has, I used since my childhood. If I may. Yeah, we understand you. We understand this. That's great. And I believe when I was saying that the war destroyed culture, I actually meant that when we start talking about culture as about actions of politicians, well, it would be stupid to refuse reading Shostakovich, Stravinsky, Chekhov, Prokofiev, because some of them lived in Soviet era and some of them uh, lived in Tsar-ruled Russia. And I've heard that opinion. I would not like to read Tolstoy because he was the representative of the empire. I believe that these things are the elements of war. And now, if we go back to the situation which happens right now and which lasts for six years already, I may tell you that Ukrainian authorities within all this time, time haven't found a way out of this situation. And that's a question to the elite of the country and to the intellectuals of the country who can or can not solve this issue somehow and perceive it somehow. And what can be done by the representatives of the culture would be just trying to uh, perceive it, define it, at least describe it. And I was trying to do so. I tried to describe that phenomena because that's a very complicated phenomenon. And as far as I have the floor now, we are mixing two various wars and uh, they had uh, different sources to start with. The war which uh, is current and the war which was in 3945, they had different sources and we have to have different approaches when discussing uh, them. Mr. Serhi, then I would like to clarify my question. You've dedicated uh, the movie Donbass to the current war of Russia against Ukraine. And what is your opinion and view? Because not uh, everybody saw that movie. What were your major conclusions about the nature of that war? Well, that's a very complicated question, I should tell you. I believe that we see two various concepts there which cannot go hand in hand. In what way to build the future? One concept belongs to the past and the other concept tries to build the future based on what the European culture has to offer. And they try to reborn the civilization. And these concepts, once again, they are very contradictory as regards each other. These are two very opposing opinions. 
And on the other hand, this is an anti-colonial war. This is the war for independence, because till certain point in time, till 2014, there was formal independence uh, from Russia. But in actual fact, former uh, leaders of the country didn't fly to Germany or Poland, they went to Russia. And this tells us a lot, right? The president of the country uh, fled to Russia, then the head of uh, the uh, uh, military organization. Well, of course, they flew to the countries they worked for. And since then, we have an open form of resistance, and we have to talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Serhii. And I would like to ask Tamara. Tamara, what is interesting in your book, and what we haven't touched upon yet, would be in your novel, we see a woman who is a warrior. So this uh, feminism aspect well, the daughter, a woman who is a daughter, and that's the name of the novel. If we're talking about the Second World War, we are not paying that much attention to women. And we are talking about a woman here. Why, why have you chosen this topic? And in what way this war is interesting from the viewpoint of a woman? Well, if you allow me a small comment. Let us not say that the fact that war lasts for seven years, let's not perceive it as a defeat of Ukraine, you know. Um, the, there was the Blitzkrieg or a lightning war um, within two weeks. That at least was the plan of the Russian Federation to turn Ukraine into uh, part of the Russian Empire again, and everything was was done to do so. That had to be a blitzkrieg, I tell you. But the fact that the small Ukraine, very small country for the seventh year in a row, is resisting the biggest army of uh, the world and is actually resisting the country, which is allocating unlimited resources on war. They will be saving on culture, on the life standards of uh, their citizens, on the development of their country, but they will never uh, save money um, on war. They are really investing huge amounts of money and huge human resources into war with Ukraine, propaganda, etc. And you know, mm, there was the risk that Ukraine would cease to exist, but that's not so now. And it surprised everyone, and that's already a huge victory of Ukraine. This is something we have to be proud of, and we have to be proud of our people, our army, and our civilians. And I I personally believe that's a huge success of our country, that we are still fighting, that we are not. Well, yeah, that's not what I meant. Yeah, but we have to acknowledge our victories and be proud of our victories. It's uh, difficult to imagine any other European country in this situation. Well, our neighbors, at least, would not be able to resist in this situation, I believe. Well, and Poles and... Uh, uh, peoples of Belarus and to send that. Speaking about a woman's image, if I were a man, I would be writing from the viewpoint of a man. But as far as I'm a woman, I clearly understand the woman's standpoint. And I see in what way this very war is destroying the destinies of women, and in what way women and children are affected in the first place. And these are people uh, whose calling is to leave, to raise, bring up protect, and they find themselves in a situation when they have to save their own lives and their families, and refugees, and people who live within the occupied territories, and women who live uh, at the front line, and those who've lost their husbands, and those who are still worried about their husbands, and women warriors. There are a lot of women like that, and uh, that's the whole layer of the society which requires attention, and uh, mm, they have to be stuck it, in what way they are so resistant, they are holding up. And when we are talking about the history of the Second World War, we are talking about the story of a mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and all the women which are there behind our backs, standing our interests, and which uh, were deported to Germany, which survived famine, and uh, which survived everything.
And uh, that was a very interesting material, and that was a huge honor for me to um, have a look at this topic, consider this topic, and hear their voices. They are actually screaming and yelling, but they are doing it outside, no one uh, inside themselves, no one can hear them, and you have to be on their tune to hear that scream and those tears, and I had to write about that. What do you think? Uh, we actually really refusing to accept the global culture. For example, we don't need Tchaikovsky, as Mr. Serhi said. Well, I usually hear this argument about Tchaikovsky in a context as follows. You don't want to use Russian language and uh, you are somehow against Tchaikovsky, etc. Well, no, we are not against Tolstoy or Tchaikovsky. Uh, well, there is the classical literature of Russia, and I don't believe it shall uh, be studied as deeply as it was uh, studied in the Soviet Union, at least at schools. I don't think the children has to um, be chanting uh, Onegin of Pushkin uh, by heart, at least in Russian language. We have to have a very diverse uh, uh, curricular at school. We shall be um, covering, considering various poets and writers, not just Russian ones, of course. They shall be one of those, of course. And right now, we have to really deal with creation of our own classical literature, our own classics, and our own cultural product. We shall not be fighting cultures of others. We shall cherish our own culture and bring the new life into our country, not to fight against someone's cultures. But we have to have the space for that, right? Well, in order to free the space for Ukrainian language on the TV, in the movies, in the music, in the books, we had to uh, really deprive the Russian product of that space, because the Russian product was dominating. Well, we really had to make that step. But from, from the viewpoint of Ukrainians, that is justified, and that is normal. We have to take her off our own. Well, we shall not forget about our speakers online. Well, especially Miss Irina, you were traveling the East and you shot your film in Krasnohorivka and well, people speak various languages there, right? Ukrainian, um, uh, Russian, or the mixture of these two. So, in what way do you see this heritage? Uh, Russian classics and uh, language. Well, your characters, they are creating their own videos. That's their own creativity, right? This is your movie about their movies, so to say. Well, in what way can you analyze that? Well, to tell you the truth, we are touching upon very many topics, and uh, the language issue is a minefield, you know. One step to the left, one step to the right, and another big discussion starts. I would like to tell you the following. Ukraine has always been at this intersection of various influences, and with this war, which is uh, currently happening in the east of Ukraine, we also have an information war, informational war. And and we, those who write about that and who shoot movies about that, we have our own narratives and we tell various stories and what I've faced, what I was even afraid of, was a huge responsibility. Because when you come closer to that topic, you understand you have this powerful tool in your hands because you have the power of telling your story as you want to tell it. Let me explain what I mean. If we're talking about documentaries, and I really like like uh, that genre, and I really would like to just watch and contemplate and hear the voices of those who would like to be heard, and I have to help them to be heard. But documentaries would also be someone's view of the situation, because that is still you selecting whom to uh, um, present in your movie, uh, etc. And on my side. I would like to tell you when the war started, I felt this internal urge to go to Donbass territories to see it all with my own eyes. Well, yes, I was not the one who had weapons in her hands, but I could tell the story of those with weapons in their hands. And uh, the 
Um, the movie An Earth Blue as an Orange, it was an opportunity for me to have a look in what way civilians live in the territory adjacent to the war zone. And the closer you come to that all, and the closer you look at it all, you understand there are more and more questions, much more than answers. And at the very beginning of the war, a lot of things looked black and white, but now I can see a lot of hints of colors there. But again, speaking about the voices and whose voice shall be heard in the first place, it's very important for the eyewitnesses of the war to um, say the word. And when we were talking before this about uh, uh, women's images in literature and movies, and I had an honor to join the project Invisible Battalion. Uh, that's the movie which includes various uh, stories of women who are in this way or another are protecting their motherland, Ukraine, in this very war. And if we come back to my last movie, to uh, the most recent movie I have created, well, we see a mother for children who live in the territory adjacent to the war. They shoot the movies about themselves, so these amateur uh, videos. But what's important in that all? That they want to, to tell their story to someone in their own way. Because... Well, of course, we can talk about people living there from various points of view and using various quality of uh, the lens of the camera. But it's important for them to uh, give their voices to the world. Uh, well, Mr. Marius, I would like to ask you what statements were important for you as for the man of art, that's one. And the second thing, is it clear for you as for the person who lives not in Ukraine, but outside, that Ukraine is trying to cherish its uh, cultural field, that we are identifying ourselves right now. Uh, yes, totally. I think, we, I mean, if we would if we would look to Ukraine from perspective of like 2000, I don't know, 2050, 2060, we'll see that, you know, uh, it's a very important time for Ukraine now, and uh, in fact, it's uh, building of nation, and I think you understand it very well. But I, I want to come back a little bit to the conversation, and I, I, I totally agree with everything what Sergei Loznitsa told, and it's especially that it's very difficult to talk at the same time about the uh, Second World War and the case for in, in Ukraine. Because, and culture in, in this in this context. Because you know, in Second World War, culture didn't function. And when I, for example, I, when I was reading uh, uh, autobiographical book of Ingmar Bergman, uh, Eterna Magica, and uh, okay. he's writing that 1943, he's doing a new movie, feature movie. You know, it looked like horrible. You know, we, we imagine what Europe is. It's in fire, in blood. And so, but but Sweden was neutral, and he can we do that. So same now, uh, like if culture still function, uh, like 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 it is now in Ukraine, is restaurants functioning? You know, it, current, uh, we have not that total war that that was Second World War, and then uh, culture can really uh, uh, can can be somehow uh, be uh, instrument of. Stopping this war. You know, for example, in 2014, I was in Maidan, uh, in the very end of Maidan. And then in, in the August of 2014, you know, uh, on, on news, I just watched, you know, some, it was the uh, last day of August and it was very bloody uh, day in, in Donbass war. And that day I was, I started thinking, you know, what if this war, what if this Russian aggression would come to Lithuania? I mean, am I ready to kill? enemies kill you know, to be warrior i'm not sure and i understood that probably i can you know i can use my my talent my you know my, my path just to to do something that it wouldn't come as that that you know, wouldn't come with it. and 
No, I, I started. I started to write. I wrote play about Donbass and some other things, many pieces to European newspapers. But you know, uh, now because I'm I'm looking to that from distance. My aim is to you know show as possible uh, as much as possible you know hor horribility of the war. You know, not uh, to take out all, all the heroism. You know. Uh, uh, so that nobody would like to repeat it. That's yeah. I think that's that's functional. Thank you, Marius. Victoria, we also wanted to involve you in our conversation. As you can see, we're discussing here, we talk about two different wars and they're totally different. We have no chance to compare them. Or maybe some things are still similar here. We have to keep two events. Uh, so all these images of fascists which are peddled by Russian propaganda and its aggression against Ukraine, that's also there to talk about it. So what's your opinion about that? Well, I think that, first of all, World War II emerges in the discussions about Russian-Ukrainian war, not because we brought World War II into this war, but as you were saying, Russia itself, the aggressor itself, constantly uses this rhetoric, instrumentalizes this memory about World War II, and we have to be responsible for that and answering. Uh, we have to use the same method of uh, of our enemy and uh, instrumentalize memory about our uh, those who died. And it seems to me that uh, there was no uh, glorification of victories in Russia despite all efforts. And coming back to the beginning of discussion, I would like to praise Ukrainians a little bit, that actually there was no glorification of victory. That I've seen well, maybe because I was growing up in Lviv, but still it seems to me that we have this vaccine, we still have antibodies in our blood against that. Because Ukraine during World War II was occupied in full, and as for the territory of Russia, it was only occupied by five percent. So, therefore, the war was happening here. That is why Ukrainians have known for a long time what war is. And here I'm approaching the other parallel, which we used totally legitimately. Actually, culture doesn't speak in the language of textbooks, doesn't talk about armies, doesn't talk about states. The culture talks about people. And if we talk about people, then in human dimension, no doubt, memories of our grandpas and grandmas and our post-trauma, post-memory that we have about World War II, of course, they're actualized by this war. And in human dimension, of course, we are talking about that. We are talking about war, and no doubt we are also talking about occupation. When we talk about occupied uh, territories occupied by Russia and about the Crimea, that you should never forget, then of course in our memory we always have World War II, because this is how human conscience works. And that's why I think that we have to we totally have the right to talk about these two things in this context. Yes, we totally have the right to talk about these things in, in this context. And yes, you have just mentioned occupied territories, victory glorification, vaccine against uh, that that Ukrainians have. But the latest of us, Donetsk and Lugansk, are renamed into Stalin and Voroshilovgrad. So here, these two wars are combined. And that's to my statement on what's the difference. Now we feel that there is difference, that for us it's painful and this shouldn't be allowed. So to what extent Ukrainians on non-occupied territory can counter propaganda, propaganda from Russia, can feel where they are and not to actually give in to it Achtem, on non-occupied territories? I understand that over there the situation, I mean, that there is a lot of imposition, which is totally artificial, so... Well, that's a multi-layered question. On the one hand, we should and we can say that this is about your own taste, that is shaped inside a family, uh, so it depends on who you meet on your way, who you can then call your teachers, you know, who were strategic in pointing without understanding a certain way. 
towards discoveries. On the other hand, there is also such challenging times there should be uh, like that. I can be right or not right, but I have seen in my experience many times that to, to have an opportunity to counter this hybrid war, a very important component of which is information war, we require support of the strategy from the state. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to talk about this, to formulate, to offer the vision of the strategy. That we have to do that. And even if at some time, you cannot uh, reach someone. We still have to stop and say, okay, I'm not listening to, I'm not doing anything, I'm just sitting down. Because, for example, for me, and for you as well, I don't have any other way. Because my people are there, my parents are in the Crimea, my two children are in the Crimea, my kin is in the Crimea. And if I'm not going to do anything for that, I'm not going to actualize and say that Russia occupied my motherland, if they're not going to reflect or speak on this, what I'm doing here, and how I'm going to look into the eyes of my parents who are there, without fear, telling me here, don't be silent. If I know that my children, my children, Actually, the border guards say, that, okay, say hello to your father sometimes who watch him. So we have no right not to do that because it's really so. And for me, one of the most, one of my, the most terrible things for me is that understanding that God forbid your children are going to be brought up in a different paradigm because they won't know their language. I didn't know my language in childhood because everywhere, everything that was around me told me that if you want to do a career or to go to university or to have an opportunity to to have wide geography and culture, you don't need to you don't need to know your language, but you have to know your Russian language. And no matter what happens, if uh, this hybrid war was not connected with the language, we would treat it differently, in a totally different way. But unfortunately, the political force of Russia, the political power of Kremlin, and did it so that we have practically no opportunity to separate and only due to huge efforts and thanks to our parents, maybe teachers, you are able to draw this boundary that there are different people that there are different people of this civilizations because they speak this language, but unfortunately we are to blame and our thing is to actually Context. to um, actually turn our context. Okay, um, thank you. Now I have this question while you were talking. Okay, we see that some Ukrainians found themselves hostages. The Crimea occupied territories in the East. And we can now put up uh, questions as people who are part of culture. Very often we hear from the authorities lately that uh, uh, you're doing something so that they come back to us and all that. But still, for example, Tamara, I have a question for you. I know uh, that they read your book on occupied territory, and they give you feedback. In your opinion, is art an efficient weapon, an efficient method to actually bring it? Uh, yes, actually they turn to the people who live in the occupation, uh, whose life is daily suffering and who have significant risk preserving Ukraine in, the, in themselves. You know, 
friends, we are going to come back there. We will come back to the occupied territories. Donetsk, Luhansk and Crimea are going to be Ukrainian again. We will come and we will restore justice there. We will restore Ukrainian presence there. We will allow people who now live uh, with curfew and other limits, uh, people who live under the threat of getting into a concentration camp and torture chambers, will allow them to live freely. And uh, Ukraine is not going to forget you. The character of my book is the resident of Donetsk, and these uh, uh, events are in Donetsk. Um, this is a book on occupied territories and occupation, and this book spurred huge interest all over Ukraine. We traveled on almost all regions of Ukraine with it. And uh, with this book, we actually collected almost all awards and nominations in 2019, which were available for book products. And there was huge interest from the press and from the audience. This means that the topic itself is not, I mean, this is something that people need. Because people laugh and speak and discuss for a teach presentation. There's there's a lot of people coming who tell me, you know, like I have an aunt or a sister who used to live there and we left it. But during these meetings I understood that we have these close relations and we have to do that. When we talk about Donetsk or Crimea, you cannot say that but because it's about your heart or your lung being amputated, this is something that your organs can't live without. So occupied territory just like that for us. So, of course, they are going to be brought back to Ukraine. This is our land and our people. Um, and we do everything possible so that it happens. And we shouldn't come down, we shouldn't allow this issue to be actually forgotten. It has to be brought up at every forum. You have to stress and you have to repeat. We have patience, we still have energy. We're going to wait and find as much as our forces allow us. But we're going to do it, but we cannot give up occupied territories. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Our broadcast is going to finish soon, but of course we wanted each of you, our guests, to sum up today's conversation. And quite possibly uh, you have some interest in a new opinion or something that you really wanted to tell our audience. Sergei Loznica, could you please start uh, very briefly from each of us, because we really have to finish up, but very briefly the main, the most important things. Well, to counter propaganda, it is enough to tell the truth. Okay, thank you. That's the shortest that I can recommend. And uh, then, that's uh, that depends on your talent and what we need to do. A talent doesn't depend on us. That's already the want of birth. And what we should do? We need to uh, totally reformat the language. And then propaganda is not going to reach you. And uh, everything that uh, talk that is said from side influences the country. And it's going to be like that because you are going to reformat the language. But that's very complicated work. That means reformatting culture, you know. And this is a task of for several people. For tens of people, we have to get together for this call, but that's a rather complicated work because here it is about in-depth things. Yes, thanks. So, one minute for each person, we have to finish on time. Irina, what do you think, what would be the most important statements of today that we produced here on this broadcast together with you? What would you note? I don't know. Uh, my thoughts are running in all directions, and maybe the statement that each in their own place needs to say, tell the truth. Actually, this is what it is. But on the other hand, truth? I mean, we learned to tell the truth. And again, I talked uh, about it in the very beginning of our broadcast, that uh, you can talk about all of that differ in different ways. And here it is about huge responsibility of each of us, how we talk about that. Because, of course, we filmmakers know what it is to tell the truth, to use different optics. So every 
person on their place, I mean, we'll understand very well that the same object and the same story, the same senses can be shown very differently. So here it is about individual responsibility and collective responsibility. And of course, the world is changes, Ukraine changes, we're changing and we're here and now forming this new language, which we learn to speak. Uh, what was happening to us, and I don't know. It is hard to sum up, really. Okay, thank you, Irina. Marius, what would be your conclusions? What would be your final word? I know, again, I must agree with Sergei Loznitsa. I think, you know, the, uh, it's uh, the worst thing if culture in, 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 in the face of war would become the propaganda. And, of, of course, it's, it's very painful when you hear, you know, the propaganda from other side and you want to answer with the same, but that's the biggest mistake, because then you just keep feeding that propaganda and you're becoming the same dragon. So saying the truth and not... Not, 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 not becoming them. That's the, the main thing. Okay, and Victoria Marina, something from you. What would you notice the most important in our discussion? What touched you the most? Well, I think that the main thing we shouldn't become like our enemies. We have to remember that war dehumanizes, polarizes society, it makes the world black and white, but culture, on the contrary, brings back human and humane. And I thought that in World War II, we had the symbol, the eternal flame. There is nothing bad in that symbol, but this is something, this fire, this is the memory maintained by the state in a centralized way. But we Ukrainians have a better symbol when everybody remembers, and when the anniversary of our tragedy, we light candles, each of us in our windows. And I would really want us to put these candles, not due to the famine, just to the famine, but so that we learn to do that and remember each uh, person who died in Second World War, who died from the Holocaust or during deportation of Crimean Tatars. And culture needs to uh, show those who we don't see. And we have to always remember about the people in occupied territories, about Crimean Tatars. And most probably I wanted to finish up in three for farewell. See you in Donetsk. See you in Lugansk. See you in Bakhchisarai. Thank you. Thank you for these words. And the guests in the studio, again, what are you going to say? Well, I'm happy that, first of all, we had, uh, thanks to all guests, a great conversation about something that is the tool that makes a human out of a human, a culture, its memory, its heritage. And what I confirmed for myself again, I have to grow for myself. I, I shouldn't forget that each day I can reveal something for myself to move on and to do it so that those for whom it's harder than for myself to actually make it a bit better. Okay, Tamara, don't be afraid of the military topic in art. Even if you cry over a film or a book, these are good tears. These are tears of pride, purification and gratitude that we have our contemporaries living next to us. Ukraine will stay. Don't be afraid and keep working. Everything is going to be fine. Thank you for your opinions. And uh, in our marathon, which is taking place on three TV channels, we're going to have a small pause and each TV channel is going to uh, take the authority and show its product. I would also like to say thanks to all speakers who have been with us for these two hours. Thank you, friends, for your great reflections and for your creative practice. Thanks from myself to all participants. I would like to remind you that the TV Marathon Peace and War is going to come back at 7.30. The topic of the full module will be World War II totalitarian and challenges for current Europe. You are going to hear Petro Poroshenko and Andres von Rasmussen and Kurt Walker and Donald Tusk. So please watch the continuation of Marathon at 19.30, 7.30 and we say goodbye to you. Thanks to our guests and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.